Thanks everybody for coming along. I'm Louise Swin, I'm the Editorial Director of Sleepers Publishing. Welcome, Edward. What a huge pleasure this is for us all. Thanks for coming such a long way. Thank you. By way of introduction, though I know to you he needs no introduction, Edward St Auburn was born in London in 1960 and educated at Westminster School and Keble College, Oxford. He's the author of seven novels, of which Mother's Milk was shortlisted for the booker. His first novel, Nevermind, won the Betty Trask Award. This novel, along with Bad News and Some Hope, became a trilogy now collectively published under the title Some Hope. The Patrick Melrose series concludes, or does it, with At Last, the fifth Patrick Melrose novel. Edward's other fiction consists of On the Edge, which was shortlisted for the Guardian Fiction Prize, and A Clue to the Exit. I am, and I have to declare it, a fan. I think Alice Siebold says it best when she says, the Melrose novels are a masterwork for the 21st century by one of our greatest prose stylists. I've played my hand. <laughs> Edward, much has been made of the autobiographical element of the Melrose books, and I'm interested in why you chose fiction, if indeed fiction was a choice for you. Um, over, or aside from memoir, whenever I hear about somebody who's written a memoir, I assume that there's uh, lots of lie or made up things in it. And yet I, when I think of fiction and I publish and love fiction, I always think it's a way to a kind of truth. But for you, I don't know, was it a choice to write fiction instead of memoir? Uh, it never occurred to me to write a memoir and um I suppose there are, there are several reasons for that, uh, although since it never occurred to me, I'm not an expert on the reasons. <laughs> um, but uh, looking back and making it up as I go along, I suppose that the novel, it's partly a question of, of, of tradition and, and the individual talent. It's a question of what tradition has impressed and moved you most and wanting to be part of that. So I always wanted to write a, a, a novel. Um, and that's half the answer. And then I also wanted to distance myself as much from the subject matter as possible and put as much formality between uh, me and the, the emotionally um, difficult material that I was dealing with. It's very artificial to set a book uh, on one day in one place. and. Um, and yet I've done it four times. It's only Mother's Milk that, that's set, but at least at the same month over four years. So those kinds of uh, formalities and the third-person narration were all distancing devices so that I could keep a cool head while I, while I wrote these novels. Given, given what you're saying, was it difficult in the end when you did out yourself, and I understand that you, you, you know, you're asked in, in conversations like this about the level of truth, and, and so of course you've had to say the truth, but has that, have you had cause to regret that, or has that been no, okay? No, I'm, I'm rather keen on telling the truth. I, uh, why would I regret it? I do, I do, but it, it's, it's potentially confusing to think that I... Uh, another reason, I mean, auto, the most famous autobiographies of all time, you know, uh, Augustine or Rousseau, begin with the, the word confession. You know, they're, they're confessions. And I'm not making a confession. Um, I'm, I, I'm trying to... Uh, understand a situation which I was very mystifying to me, and I wanted to surround it with witnesses rather than claim to know the truth myself. If I'd known the truth already, I might not have had to write these novels, but it's been a process of discovery for me. Mm. And um, I suppose if they have any, any freshness to them, it's because I'm discovering at the same time as the reader what's going on. Mm, brilliant. That actually explains a lot about them. I do think the cruelty is evident throughout throughout the books, balanced with, and I feel as though there is a compassion underlying um, the the characters. I'm interested in how you got to that point of compassion for these. Sometimes you'd have to say cruel people, people like Patrick's father David, people like Nicholas Pratt. Yes, I think the compassion. Um becomes more dominant in, in Mother's Milk and in At Last. Um, mm. And 
which were written quite a lot later than the first three. I think in the first three there are some good characters like Anne, Anne Ison or Anne Moore as she is in the first novel. And um, but the uh, the the narration is still uh, quite. Uh, quite dry relative to Mother's Milk and at last. I think the compassion is something that's, that, that's grown and developed. Um, at the same time, you're right that right from the beginning, I thought there was no point in, in presenting David Melrose, however extreme uh, his perversion, his sadism, his contempt and his snobbery might be as a, as a monster. He's a, he's a, he's a human being um, who's turned out that way. Um, and that's why it's really frightening, of course. Mm. In a piece about the Melrose novels in The New Yorker, James Wood says, Patrick's only ally is his intelligence. There are few apparent strategic advantages to seeing his life as lucidly as he does. Do you think that that's true? I think that, um, well, I mean, forgetting my own particular case, I think that that um, certainly in, with tragic characters, uh, lucidity is part of the tragedy, you know, um, and in many cases. For instance, I mean, in Hamlet's case, it's supremely his lucidity that's part of his tragedy. In other cases, it's, it's, it's not the case. Um, but for myself, I, I don't really want to badmouth lucidity. I, mean, <laughs> um, I can't, I mean, what's the alternative? Being completely muddled the whole time. I, I mean, that is how I've felt most of my life. And these, these books are an attempt to be lucid about things that were completely overwhelming and chaotic and um, which seemed to defy lucidity. Um, but those are the only things worth writing about, things that seem impossible to write about. Otherwise, it's a, a you know, it's such an odd occupation, <laughs> being, being alone in a room for year, years on end on the verge of a nervous breakdown trying to <laughs> write these sentences, which maybe no one will read. Um, so, yeah, it has to be, it has to seem very nearly impossible to be worthwhile, I think. To the person who's doing it seem... To, to me, yes, um, yeah, absolutely. If not a novelist, was there anything that you, anything else, any other art form that you might have turned to as a way of expressing? Did you ever fall back? No, I'm, there's nothing I'm remotely good at, um, <laughs> and so, except maybe writing, and that's, that's it. If it hadn't worked... Um, Comedian didn't... <laughs> um, well, my horror of public appearances <laughs> might have sort of brought that um, career to a halt. But I did a lot of private comic performances. I mean, there's a chapter... <laughs> in Bad News, where Patrick is, is taken over by lots of voices, and he becomes this sort of ventriloquist dummy mm. for, for all these voices. He has such a weak sense of self that he's invaded by one voice after another, and they respond to each other, and this kind of grotesque play evolves. And, I mean, that is how I spent a lot of my life. But I, I wouldn't, I didn't want to you know, paying audience. Um. <laughs> but maybe great for uh, dinner parties. As long as you're at a dinner party with yourself. And <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I obviously I was joking about the, the comedian, but the humour is, is incredibly evident in these books. And for me, it's one of the things that um, keeps me turning the pages so, so quickly. Um, and I'm interested in whether or not the humour was a conscious choice or if that's something that is just how you, you communicate. I think it's, it's too, too deep to dig. I mean, I don't, I don't think that I can say why um, I have the taste that I have and the sensibility that I have. Um, and certain things are just uh, a given. 
And taste is mysterious for every different writer. At some point, the sentence doesn't have to go on being rewritten. It clicks into place. Mm -hmm. And what makes it seem to click to a writer is his taste or her taste. And um, but it's it's not. You, it's very difficult to analyze it beyond a certain point. And I'm, you know, I see the world as. Um, torn between, um, you know, heartbreak and absurdity, mm -hmm. and I also see it very naturally in in images and pictures. So metaphors and similes um, just uh, spring up, as it were, and and this alternation between um, comedy and um, anguish is just there already. Mm. Um, <clears throat> but the sentences aren't there already, and you know that's so they have to be written. But they're written from that base, which I can't analyse for you. And do you get there quite quickly, or do you have to rework them to to get them as finely honed? Oh, constantly, I um, rework them a lot. I'm I'm very bad writer um, on the first. You know, twenty or thirty goes, um, but twenty or thirty. But I, except for dialogue, because of this this thing we were talking about earlier, this feeling of being um, possessed, which isn't as strong as it used to be, because I'm not as mad as I used to be. But um, but this feeling of of uh, being able to flow into other mentalities and attitudes um, quite easily. So dialogue sometimes is um, is just written down uh, and remains in its first version. But everything else is rewritten again and again until it looks natural. And are you writing quickly when you write? Um, I, write I, I might write a, f a first stab at a paragraph reasonably quickly. But it's it might it might be days before it uh, clicks. Mm. As a reader, I feel as though there, there's a con contempt for some of the characters. But in the end, I'm not sure that any of the characters is exactly irredeemable. And I'm interested in how you arrived at that wisdom. If it came through writing the series, or if that was something that you knew at the start would just be a a dead end. I think I think the the series grows less and less harsh, as I've said, and mm. that by the by the end, uh, um, compassion dominates, and that's perhaps what enables it to end. But you know, it wasn't planned that way. But Eleanor, whose funeral is the subject, uh, Patrick Melrose's mother, whose subject, uh, whose funeral is the subject of the last book. Um, is seen from lots of points of view, you know, not just by Patrick mm. um, as a betrayed son, but also by Mary, who regards her as a bad mother, but as a fellow mother, and also by Annette, who thinks she's a living saint, and also by her sister, Aunt Nancy, who thinks she's a class traitor, and also by by Johnny, who thinks, because he's a psychoanalyst, that she's lacking in self-knowledge and so forth. And I suppose, so, so that all these points of view are available, and there, the narrator, I think, by the time you get to it last, has sort of evaporated to some extent, and you just have the characters presenting them their attitudes directly, one after another, and there's nobody telling you what to think of their attitudes. Um, so, but I think the, I suppose, you, I, sub, I don't know what you live with, actually, I'm not going to prescribe any um, uh, idea of what people conclude from all that. Um, but there are many points of view. There's an arena of points of view. And that's true of Mother's Milk as well, and I think less true of the first three, which are... Um, Harsher. Mm. Mm. I think, I mean, one of the things that I did find very appealing is many of the characters are very good with this sort of witty repartee. Do you know people like that who are that quickly? No, I that don't know quickly? anyone as good as my characters. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I, I mean, there's no. 
There's no point in, in writing down what people actually say and how people actually talk. Um, and, uh, you know, the, Henry James said that dialogue was, you know, characters talking about the plot. They need to be completely on subject and they need to be as articulate as possible about it. Um, otherwise, I'm wasting the, the reader's time. Um, so I'm not claiming that it's uh, completely realistic. Of course it's improved. <laughs> I mean, why would you buy a novel if it wasn't an improvement? I mean, sort of eavesdropping in Starbucks or something. <laughs> I mean, it's, yeah, it's hard to see how any of these people could hold down jobs because they must spend their entire life thinking about the fabulous things that they're going to say. <laughs> That's right. You, you, you recently had Mother's Milk made into a screenplay and you were one of the screenwriters on that, is that right? I was involved, yes, but I was really told by the director which bit of of dialogue he wanted to have airlifted from the book into the screenplay. So it wasn't a sort of in-depth education in the art of screenplay writing. Um, right. But I, I was around when, um, when it was made and I was very, I was very touched. I was, quite, I was rather shocked when I suddenly realised all these people had got together to make a film. Um, of my book. More recently, um, Channel 4 have, have said they want to do a series of all five books, um, which I'm, I'm looking forward to. Fantastic. Are you going to have any involvement in that? I'm supposed to be a consultant, which, as we know, is a very slippery word. Um, <laughs> I, could, I mean, I could do nothing at all. Or, <laughs> or write the whole thing, I don't know. But um, I think I'm supposed to look at the screenplays and if, they, you know, if there's something that I think has gone very badly wrong to, to say so. But, but it is another art, you know. Um, and I've spent so long trying to make them work as novels. I'm the last person in the mm. world to make them work in another form. Mm. You know. um, and they should ask almost anyone else. Who would you have play Patrick Melrose? I have no idea. <laughs> um, there's a lot of a lot of fantasy casting goes on in this situation. <laughs> the, someone optioned these books back in when they were first published in '92, or when the first three were published in '94, mm -hmm. and they have every year since. And um, at the first fantasy casting, they said Ray Fiennes would be perfect to play Patrick. And at the last one, they said Ray Fiennes would be perfect to play David, Patrick's father. <laughs> so I better quickly write a grandfather in. You know. <laughs> Hasn't yet been in the series. And then Ray Fiennes can play him. I'm interested in whether or not people can change in, in real life, in literature, obviously. So <laughs> Well, literature has to deal with people growing um, just to keep momentum, keep plot moving along. And I, I found I ruminated for a long time once I finished the quintet, the Melrose Quintet, on whether or not I was bringing to it my own positive spin on the feeling that he, you know, there, there has been quite a lot of growth and, and I feel very positively for his future and, you know, want the best for him, whether or not that was me bringing to it, you know, what I wanted to. And I guess I'm interested in whether or not you think and to what extent people can really change. Well, I think, I think my answer is in the books. I think the last chapter of At Last um, does uh, present a, a, a kind of equanimity on Patrick's part. Uh, you know, he's reached a a post-parental equanimity. And that's, he's relatively free. He's understood his conditioning. He's no longer dominated by the past. He might be able to, to pay attention to what's happening to him in the present. And that's, you know, that's a, a huge victory um, for him. And I think, I think people can change, but it, it's very, very difficult. And the, the most important 
fundamental thing is motivation. And of course, no one could be more motivated than Patrick Melrose, you know, because he, 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 he finds his thoughts, memories, and feelings completely unbearable the way they are. And so he's very, he's very motivated. I think if you don't have to change, why bother? You know, lots of people are really nice already. <laughs> I'm sure none of you need to change, but he did. He really needed to change. <laughs> can can writing be therapy or therapeutic? Do you think, or is it is it for you? Um, no, it, it just made it much worse, really. Um, and because of this lucidity you're talking about, continually digging things up, wanting to look into them more closely, it was it was. Um, entirely painful. Now that it's finished, I think there is um, something has happened, whether it's what Freud called sublimation or not, I'm not sure, but, um, but something, you know, horrific and, and chaotic and unbearable has been turned into something which I hope is enjoyable. And that transformation uh, has, has transformed um, my mind, you know, but it, but I didn't set out with a therapeutic intention, or uh, which brings us back to what we were talking about earlier. It's not a confession. I set out to write a novel. My first responsibility is to interest the reader. Mm -hmm. I, I remember when I was at either at school or or at university reading English, there was some book. I think it was called with a very grand title like The Rhetoric of Fiction or something, and I opened up. And then it had this modest but important first sentence, which was, the function of style is interest, you know. And, mm. you know, it's a very simple statement, but that's the point. Mm. Um, you know, if it's a communication, if it's a secret diary, you can say anything you like, but if it's a communication, it has to, the, the intention must be to interest mm. the, the reader. You know, the, the communication is only finished when the book is read. You know, it's a private, in a way it's an individual communication between the writer and the reader. Even if there are a million readers, it's still an individual moment. Mm. Which meant a lot to me when I was young. You know, I felt very isolated. And reading gave me that relief from isolation of feeling connected with someone else's um, mind. Have you always been a big reader? Oh, yes, a very slow, painfully slow reader. But I've always sort of sounded the sentences in, uh, in my head while I was reading. I read very slowly, I mean that slowly. Um, and that may have affected my, my style, you know. It may be that I, I imagine the sentences being read out. Um, I'm not sure about that. If so, then that's to our benefit. <laughs> what, is the, what are some of the books that you go to again and again? Um, well, I haven't, I've, you know, there are lots of things I haven't even read once. I can't afford to start rereading too but much. In your yes. head, at least. Obviously. In my head. I think, I think in my, um, I think there's a kind of window for influence, um, mm. and that that sort of for me was between late adolescence and my and my mid twenties and before I started writing myself. And somehow once I've started writing I, I um I'm taking in very little uh, new um basic information, you know, that's having an effect on my sense of of what works and doesn't work. But during that period when I was very strongly affected by other people's work, I mean, it was very obvious people, you know, Henry James, James Joyce, Nabokov, Proust, etc. Um, their Beckett was a, a big mm -hmm. influence. Um, quite a lot of them are mentioned in Bad News. There are individual lines which are quotations from those people and also from Nightwood by Juno Barnes and um, The Myth of Sisyphus by Camus. Those bo books were of burning importance to me then, mm. um, other people's books. And then somehow I switched from being a, um, a fanatical reader to being a fanatical writer and 
I don't see why the two shouldn't coexist, but they, they haven't in my case. You know. Mm. Um, As in, you're not just not able to find the, the, the time, the mental space to read. I'm as just much. not. I'm I'm just not uh, as permeable as I was. You mm. know, then um, I'm. I and I read. I read things with a completely sort of technical gaze now. It's it's quite sad in a way. Whereas I I can go to a film and I'm just this gormless consumer. But with a book I'm just thinking, oh he's done it that way, could have done it that way, mm -hmm. you know, um you know, maybe that's better as two as two sentences instead of what well, I'm just thinking of it the whole time in that way. So I don't I don't just um there's something less relaxed about my <laughs> abs mm. absorption of work now, of writing. Yeah, I've got you this gormless consumer of films. Music, <laughs> anything, anything else. It's yeah, just right. this one area in which I'm very um, vigilant. Has it taken away the enjoyment of reading at all? It's a different kind of enjoyment. Mm. You know? If I think things couldn't be done better, I'm in sort of heaven, you know. Do you ever throw books across the room in disgust? Um, yes, but in a particular way, I try and sort of frisbee them so, <laughs> so that they go into the waste paper basket with a satisfying <laughs> clang or, you know, <laughs> clonk or whatever noise the waste paper brings on. So, I, um, and I've had one or two really satisfying experiences in that way. It's a bit humiliating when I miss completely, or the book opens and flaps around in <laughs> mid-air. But when you go, and it goes right in, it's... <laughs> sort of life's great achievement. Yeah. <laughs> uh, do you ever stop before you finish a book reading that? Yeah, I, what I try and do now is um, decide very early on um, whether I'm going to go on with a book. And mm. then, so quite a lot of books get abandoned in the first, say, 20 pages. But then if I go beyond that, then I feel a dogged commitment. Mm. I feel I have to go all the way to the end. But people around me sometimes hear me complain <laughs> on this journey. Once you'd published a couple of, of novels, did that alter the way that you observed and experienced events in your own in your own life, knowing you might be writing about them one day? Yes, there was something less um, uh, vague about my notebooks, you know. When I was in my 20s and I, hadn't, I kept starting novels and abandoning them, and I just sort of wrote down everything because I didn't know what I was looking for. And, um, and then my notebooks became much... Uh, uh, slimmer um, because I was I was looking for a particular thing, so I was only really interested in the thing that would um, would help with the next novel. So it changed the way I was recording recording things, and also I used to write down very literally descriptions of things or overheard bits of conversation and so forth. Whereas gradually I've I've come to to trust myself a bit, or to not myself, but my imagination that, that things will turn up, you know, um, when I need them. Have Which isn't always... strictly true. I mean, it did take me five years to write at last, and I did need things to turn up quite often, to, and nothing happened. <laughs> <laughs> Have you always kept notebooks? It's interesting that you talk about them. That, has that been something since childhood? Um, I haven't got the very early ones. Um, I did rediscover a novel I wrote when I was 12. <laughs> got to page 40. Um, how long was I it? I burnt it. Page 40, it was 40 oh, pages. Oh, right, yeah. I thought you meant got, that's how long you got no, no, before no, you started uh, to burn No, it was 40 pages. I, I, I burnt it, um, so there you go. The, and what do you give it out of The archive has lost, I can tell you, <laughs> nothing at all by my <laughs> The rich upper classes uh, have lots of rules by which they live, but in some ways in conversation they seem free of a lot of the rules of the middle classes, like being polite and not asking the, the difficult subject and not saying the obvious thing, you know, like to someone with a, a missing arm, what happened to your arm. And I, I often think that it must be freeing in a, in a way, but also terribly constricting and, and frightening maybe to live in a world with, where no subject is necessarily off 
limits. Do you think there's value to the basic rules of etiquette that prevents us from normally, although obviously this is a slightly different situation here, asking personal things of each other? Or do you, do you think there's also value in letting those rules go? Oh, I mean, of course there's a value to courtesy and a value to honesty, and they're always in competition with each other in mm. every situation. Um, and, but I think in, in, in the Melrose books um, that, uh, you know, David's disdain for middle-class morality is a, is a, is a, it's a pose. I mean, mm. he's a man who's, who's deeply perverted and... Um, <coughs> Psychopathic, it turns out by the last book, um, and he needs to. He needs some sort of fig leaf for it, and because of his particular circumstances, he can take up this pose of being, you know, um, indifferent to to um, what Nietzsche would have called slave morality. Um, but he's just, you know. A sick fuck. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I'm not really, and I'm also, I'm not speaking on behalf of some, you know, uh, some section of society. You know, it's not mm. a sociological comment. My my um, uh, my work, um, but there is nevertheless a cult of of facetiousness and of rudeness. Um, and uh, among the upper classes in England, which is obviously undesirable. You know, mm. um. in, in Bad News, somebody says of Patrick's father, but wouldn't we now say that he was just very disturbed? And they say it kind of offhandedly. To what extent do you think that meanness can be, is medicated these days? I don't know. I think at some point... I mean, this is obviously a key question for all these books. Um, and I think somewhere in Nevermind, somebody, or maybe it's me, says, maybe it's the narrator, says um, that, uh, or asks whether evil is anything more than sickness celebrating itself. Mm -hmm. I think that has to be the, um, the borderline, you know, is whether... Uh, whether people are resisting mm. their own sickness or not. Um, the presence of the sickness is uh, obviously initially not their responsibility of, at all. But mm. are they fighting against it? And David isn't. He, he is sickness celebrating itself. Mm. Mm. Irony is interesting because it's this double-edged sword and there's obviously there's lots of irony in your writing i mean it can be a defense against the world because it allows you to you know step back and detach and also amuse yourself mm. but can it also leave you cut off from um what other people but also yourself do you think can it be limiting and oppressive at all i think anything that's uh, compulsive is limiting and oppressive I think irony is quite enjoyable as long as you're, you know, you can do a few other things as well, like be sincere and you know, authentic and uh, all the rest of it. I mean, Patrick's journey is partly a journey from a compulsive irony, um, which is a sort of a, a rhetorical mirror of of his. Um, psychological predicament you know because irony is the desire to mean two things at once um, to hedge your bets to imply something else while saying one thing and from from the moment he's raped by his father you know he he becomes disembodied so he's both on the bed and escaping into the body of the gecko that that uh, scuttles across the roof and so he's been in two places at once uh, from this uh, moment of, of psychological annihilation. And that's reflected in the way that he's compulsively drawn to irony. And um, in at last, uh, he says how difficult irony is to give up. Mm. But we feel that, that by the end, you know, he can mean one thing at once. And that's uh, where he gets to in the last chapter. Mm. He becomes a whole person rather than someone who's um, broken. 
It's interesting that you said that about sincerity because I wonder if you felt that sincerity in writing or in life is considered a weakness or in bad taste. Um, I, I don't think there's any generalisation. It's, uh, um, you know, if it's trite, it's it's worthless. If it's hard won, it's valuable. If it's, um, um, you know, I think by the time Patrick's able to be sincere, one feels that, you know, some effort has gone into it mm. and, the, you know, that it... it um, it is worthwhile. I hope so, anyway. It's very hard one. Were your family surprised when you became a novelist? Um, well, no, since I'd been banging on about it since I was 12. But, <laughs> um, but, although I didn't show anyone the first, first novel. Um, I don't think there was... And, you know, I read English at university and all the rest of it. Um, so n nobody was surprised. Um, that I became a novelist. Do you mean were they surprised by the product? Um, well, that too. Yeah, have they received all of the books? Well, I'm really um, uh, very well, um, uh, surprisingly well, with a few exceptions. <laughs> that you want to go into now? <laughs> Not really. No. <laughs> um, why do you think that you get away with these these characters? Is it a combination of empathy, which sort of achieved through this omniscient voice, kind of amidst the the sort of loathsomeness sometimes? Do you think it's that empathy? I mean, there are a lot of other people. I just other writers, lesser writers, just wouldn't get away with these characters. Well, there are a lot of characters, you know, and I, I think, I mean, they're not just all, um, you know, monsters of entitlement and cruelty. There's, there, there's a huge range of characters. There's, you know, a Nat who appears to be a new age nitwit, but turns out to, to be, um, you know, spontaneously good. Um, and there's, uh, there's Mary, who's a figure of great... Uh, uh, loyalty and kindness. There's Anne Moore, right in the first novel, who, as her um, name suggests, you know, is outside the the system um, which she's observing. You know, she's the uh, the classic outsider who's not taken in um, by the lousy values of the of the Melroses and their entourage. And so. Um, First of all, I'd say that that it's that it's mm. counterpointed. Mm. Um, as as to the people who are rather monstrous, you know, David and um, Nicholas, for instance. I think David is sort of truly disturbing, but 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 realistic enough um, to um, to draw. The reader on and and Nicholas is just fun, isn't he? I mean, he's <laughs> he says these awful things, but they're quite amusing. Um, I, I hope they are very amusing yeah. <laughs> in their awfulness. Well, I'm interested in why why you write, not why you started writing, but you've, you're on record as saying why this. I go on and on. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean you're on record saying that it's it's hard. It, that you, you know, I think you've you've said that you wear towels because you sweat so much in the process of actually writing which is is quite an image I mean that's 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 full on um, yeah there are no photographs I'm pleased, <laughs> pleased to say well that was with never mind particularly I mean never mind was nearly impossible to write mm. um, but they uh, yeah I haven't um, I haven't worn a towel since, but they, they are, they, they are uh, while well writing. Um, they are. Um, I don't just air dry myself every time. I'm sure, but, um, but they, no, they, they are very, very harrowing. And one of the things I just finished a novel um, a week ago or something, and I, before I came, just before I came to Australia, and. Um, 
I, one of the things I was very interested in in that novel was whether I could enjoy myself writing. For me, that's, that's mm. the ultimate oxymoron, you know, mm. bittersweet or is nothing compared to enjoyable writing. Mm. So, um, so could I enjoy myself? And, and the answer is not entirely, but, you know, it was a huge step forward because the, the contract with Nevermind was... You know, I was, I'd had a very bleak life. I started Nevermind, and I thought, and it was a perfectly natural, it wasn't melodramatic or, you know, and I don't mean it like that now. You know, I just thought, well, either I'll write a novel that I finish or I'll kill myself. And it worked, you know, I wrote a novel. I finished, and, um, and then somehow I didn't dare disrupt that contract. I, and so I went on thinking that, if I didn't write a novel, I would go mad enough to kill myself. And it worked, and it went on working. And then the, the, after finishing it last, I thought, God, this is really unenjoyable. Maybe, <laughs> maybe I could, you know, write a new contract or uh, sign a new contract in which I'm allowed to enjoy writing. So um, the, you know, the new novel is the product of that. And... In my worst paranoid nightmares, everyone's going to say, well, it's no good. Because he, <laughs> he enjoyed himself. Um, <laughs> we shall see. I leave you to judge. Is, it, is that the last that we'll hear of Patrick Melrose? I don't know. I mean, he's finished. He's not dominated by the past, as we were saying earlier. Mm. And he's almost been defined by being someone who's, who's so preoccupied by his, his past that he's um, hardly able to, to take in what's happening to him in the present. Um, so in that sense, there's no reason to recall him. But on the other hand, maybe, you know, I'll feel like it. I'm always wrong about this. I thought I was writing a trilogy. Then I wrote Mother's Milk, and I realized it was a Melrose novel, and I was drawn back in. I thought I was going to write a second trilogy. I was wrong about that. I only needed five books to complete the story. So if I say I'm finished with him, I'm probably wrong, but I'm not going to say I haven't finished with him. I mean, I'm just... I have no idea, you know. But not, no, not soon, not soon, mm. because... I mean, what he, where, where he gets to in the last chapter of At Last is, is um, as much as I know, or possibly more <laughs> than I know. Um, mm -hmm. I, I know that some writers don't like to talk about the book that they're working on, but given that you've finished it now, can you tell us anything about the... Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Page I'm count. one of those writers who do. <laughs> no, 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 no. I mean, not until it hasn't even been copy edited. It's you know, it's not. It's not at all settled. Um, so it's so far away from being a book um, that, that, we... that I don't. It makes no sense. But we can look forward to it at least. Well, you know, it's the enjoyable one. <laughs> <laughs> it's, <laughs> yeah. Um, we're going to take some questions from the audience. There's, uh, there's a couple of microphones here, so if you've, got, if you've got a question, could you stick your hand up? Um, you said you didn't write the books for therapy, but they stopped you killing yourself. Did you have any th professional help to sort your head out before you started writing the Patrick books? Um, I, do, I don't know that that's really a, a sort of literary question. I know, it's, I, per, it's uh, a personal question and you don't have to answer it. I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's, is that a hand up? Oh, then we've got a hand up over here. I've got a couple actually. Um, Man in the Red and then, the, and then you're next. This is a literary question. Are you at the point, at least with your process, that you know how to write another novel, or do you always feel like you're a bit in the woods? I should let you know that is a writer who is asking you that question. It's uh, Stephen Amsterdam. Um, <laughs> no, how to write another novel. I'm, um, Are you convinced that it's going to happen again? I, I, I have... No, I always feel... Um, Blank, mm. um, and uh, but 
I mean, having written now eight novels, I suppose that if I did, if there was a situation that interested me and that I wanted to write a novel about, that I would have, I would have more trust than I did at the, at the beginning. It's a simple, a simple question of experience. Um, I would, I would. I would trust that the, that the novel would would happen. Yeah, I think that that's, that is a shift. I mean, I I didn't uh, I didn't used to, I didn't have any confidence at all. I think I have a I have a tiny bit of confidence now, um, or trust, something like that. I'm not sure what the word is. So it's to do with my imagination and uh, rather than my personality. My personality is hopeless. But my, but my imagination sort of comes to my rescue, you know, again and again. So I've got used to it, and I trust it to come back. <laughs> I didn't mean to suggest that I can't answer any personal questions. I, you know, I hope that wasn't experienced as rude or harsh. You know, I just meant that I don't want to answer that particular question because uh, the, if if so I understand. I mean, if people do have therapy, it works because it, it's a private communication between the therapist and the patient. Um, or so I'm told. <laughs> um, and so it just seems insane to start talking about it in front of hundreds of strangers, <laughs> if I'd had any. <laughs> but I, I don't mean to be rude. Other personal questions are fine then. So, this, this woman at the front. I, I was going to follow up um, the person before me saying this is not a literary question by saying that for me, one of the most startling things in reading these works was the way in which, and my own career has been in teaching literature, but I've done a lot of re reading of psychotherapy in the last five years or so, and throughout it, the bringing together of both the fiction writing and the insights of a whole range of extraordinary therapists. I mean, it seems not only Winnicott and Klein and um, Kahoot and the whole rethinking of narcissism and the way narcissism is spoken of in pejorative terms, but in fact we see happening in this, I think, wonderfully, particularly and at last, after Robert listens to you talking about your first swimming lesson and he offers you that extraordinary empathy that is quite... Trans oh, sorry, not you. Patrick. I mean, Patrick. Sorry, I apologise. I didn't mean that. Um, um, anyway, so when I, Robert I, I speaks understand. to Patrick... I guessed what you meant. <laughs> um, and, and offers that extraordinary empathy. I mean, there we see, and we see the development then of the most extraordinary insight that you have about your mother, and do you, I mean, this is a lovely passage. What, what, what what's the question? Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. I, I, my, and my original question, I'm sorry, I got caught up in the, no, that's okay. the point about yeah. the originality being for me bringing together. And my simple question was going to be, and this sounds a little grotesque, but how, what is it about Patrick that allows him not to follow in his father's if you like the model that he's found. He's clearly concerned that he may. And I can see some of the differences, that Eleanor is marginally, is different from but David's what, mother. what is the, the difference? The, yes, what is it that allows Patrick, the, the fictional Patrick, to not, not follow, follow that same okay. path? Yes, I, I, I think... Um, I think he just manages to crawl across the the, the threshold of, of enough self knowledge not to be caught up in um, in repetition syndrome. Is that what they call it? People who've had therapy. I do, you know. I I think. That, I mean, he's, you know, um, as you say. I mean, I'm amazed at all these. Um, psychological writings have uh, shaped my work. So it looks as if you've answered the first question, at least in terms of my reading. Um, I, I do think that, um, that we are all doomed to, uh, to repeat our, our conditioning and um, 
without um, active opposition, you know. And Patrick does engage in, you know, he's constantly trying to um, to understand his situation uh, better and to achieve detachment. There's a lot of discussion in some hope about the difference between forgiveness and, and detachment. And he's always more interested in detachment than forgiveness because he feels if, if he's forgiving his father, there's a kind of moral slope. There's an implied superiority on the part of the person who forgives over the person who's forgiven. And he's not interested in that. Um, He's, he's interested in really understanding the truth of what's happened. And I think uh, it's his passion for the truth that enables him not to, um, to repeat his father's behavior. Because once he understands what's happened to him, how could he possibly inflict it on anyone else? Mm. It's only someone who's psychologically doomed to pretend Mm. Uh, to buy into the aggressor's point of view and think that it was being done for their own good or that it was pleasurable or some some kind of perverted point of view that would enable it to be perpetuated. Mm. So... We have another question. You said that your writing isn't intended as social commentary, but I'm interested in um, how important their milieu is to the characters in the novels and whether they could have existed in a different place, a different class, and if you think they could exist in the same way today, or whether that world has changed. Um, I, do, I don't think the... I think the milieu is the... Um, it's the setting rather than the subject, and um, I think, you know, cruelty springs up all over the place. You know, I just wrote about a setting that I was at ease with. Um, and knew something about. Um, I think the particular... Uh, I mean, Nicholas Pratt, without wishing to give the plot away, dies at the end of At Last. And, you know, he's described as the, as the last <laughs> frayed cable connecting Patrick with the atmosphere of his childhood. So I think there's something about the particular kind of uh, snobbery that David Melrose and Nicholas Pratt... Uh, embody, which is now the kind of hardcore genealogical snobbery, all of that um, is it's now very hard to find you know um, and I think it's an extinct species, but it's an extinct species of a universal human drive, an obsessive concern with status, with comparison, with you know feelings of superiority or inferiority to others, you know, etc. I mean, it happens everywhere, um, and uh, I, you know, I don't think it's as as it, in a novel things have to be particular. Um, and but at the same time, they have to point to something that isn't so particular, and I think that's true of snobbery. Mm. We have another question at the back. You said when you were a student at uni that you um, your heroes were Proust and Henry James and um, other writers. Do you still draw on them when you're actually in the process of writing now? No, I mean I haven't read them since that time, but. Um, so I don't, I don't go back to the texts. I'm just saying, in a general way, the, you know, the idea of a centre of consciousness in Henry James, the idea of dealing with large um, sections of time in Proust, and having a succession of novels, the, um, you know, the, uh, you know, all, all, all the writers I read at that time made their contribution. You know, and read Madame Bovary for A level. You know, Flaubert's famous dictum, Le Style C'est Tout, you know, the obsession with the individual sentence. Um, I just drew from all these writers things which still, which are still affecting the way that I write. But I don't go back to the text and think, oh, you know, Hippolyte has his leg amputated. Shall I amputate one of my character's legs or whatever? <laughs> you know, um, it's, <laughs> it's just more a general... You know, I, I can see that um, my my sense of what makes a, a good novel comes from various um, 
experiences of reading. Mm. We have another question at the back. Well, uh, yes, just on that note, I was a little surprised when Sebastian Fawkes was asked to do a James Bond novel. Um, so on that line, how would you go about, how would you tackle <laughs> doing James Bond? We don't know that that might be what he's just finished, whatever it's just finished. <laughs> oh, I've been uncovered, yes. Um, <laughs> I have, I, you know, um, I'm longing to be asked. Um, <laughs> I gather the money's very good. I think, I mean, Sebastian um, decided to do it in six weeks, you know, and that, the trouble for me would be that that's completely out of the question, and I, you know, it would be a couple of years of my life, and um, writing a pastiche of someone else's work. And that's not the direction I've been going in so far, but I'm open. <laughs> I'm open to bribery. <laughs> I'm interested in, um, and we, we, we are running out of time, but I'm interested in whether or not you have children and whether or not having children has changed your, your writing in any way or if, in fact, you're, you know, the other way, the other way around. Um, have, being a writer has changed your interaction with children at your own. Sure. I, um, yes, yes, it, it has. I think having uh, children for everyone is a, is, is a sort of uh, reanimation of their own infancy and their own childhood um, when they see this helpless, speechless, uh, completely dependent creature. And, and, and then either their own anxiety or paranoia or, or whatever it is, is brought to the surface. So having a child is, is a sort of depth charge, really, and you're unconscious, um, if that's the right term. Um, and, and brings up all, these, all this material. Um, so I think, of, co of course, it, I mean, it's, but it's one of the most powerful things, perhaps the most powerful thing that, I don't know, anyway, it's very powerful. I'm not going to put it in a hierarchy of powerful things. There's <laughs> um, no competition. Yeah. The, the, the children appear in the later books, but it does remind me of when, when Patrick himself is a child. How, you know, I mean, you get right in there with these kids. How do you access not just how it feels to be a child, because we can all regress, I guess, given half the opportunity, but how to, how to think like a child? How do you access that so quickly and easily? Um, it's always been terrifyingly easy for me to, <laughs> um, to Im imagine the world from a child's point of view. And, um, but oddly enough, you know, I've always just been on the side of children, you know, very, very strongly. Um, even when I was at my most disturbed and um, uh, confused, you know, I, I felt um, just spontaneously protective towards children and could always feel what they were feeling and so forth. Mm. Um, so I don't, you know, um, it, um, if there's a psychoanalyst in the audience, I'm sure they can work out why so that is. Yeah. <laughs> Do you do you feel as though children are cleverer than, or more intuitive perhaps than we give them credit for in society in general, or is that just the children in the Melrose books? No, I think, I think um, the children are always saying astonishing things if they're allowed to say anything at all because they are encountering everything for the first time. Um, and, the, you know, none of us are. And so they, they're in a very privileged position. And if they can articulate that, then it can be extraordinary. Um, but on the other hand, you don't want to make a cult of it because they're often um, boring and you know, incredibly limited because they, they don't know very much. You know. <clears throat> but, you know, so both things. Uh, I've left those bits out. <laughs> Well, I would like to thank you on behalf of all of us here and at the Wheeler Centre today for giving us a bit of insight into what goes behind the amazing books that are your books. And I guess we're all looking forward to the next one. Do you know what, when will it hit publication? 
Um, well, my editor is pregnant, you know, hot subject, and so <laughs> she, it's all being built around her, her pregnancy. Um, <laughs> And uh, I think she's back from her maternity leave in April, and that's uh, next year, so that's when it'll be published. So you'll be slipping some castor oil her way and telling her to go home. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for, for coming today, Edward St. Thank you.